In Monteverde, Costa Rica, there is a mountain peak at the top of the Cordillera de Tileran, where the view stretches to the horizon in every direction. One side goes down to the Caribbean Sea. It's swathed in dense green forests. On the Pacific side, you can see coffee farms, nearby towns like Santa Elena, all the way to the Nicoya Peninsula. The Arenal volcano is even on display to the north. Mountains, volcanoes, towns, and farms. It's a view from above that has it all. But to get to this view, you have to hike up to the top of the mountain, winding your way along dozens of switchbacks. And where the trail levels off is a special spot called the Cloud Forest. And just like it sounds, these forests are literally in the clouds. In the cloud forest, the trail turns a little darker. The air is cool and humid. The trees are a lot shorter and covered in moss and other small plants that cling to them. It's a scene that's moody, mysterious, and kind of like a Dr. Seuss book. Cloud forests are where I spent a lot of time working as a scientist, looking at how climate change was impacting the soils that form the forest foundation. And a big part of the reason why I wanted to do research there, besides the fact that I fell in love with them when I studied abroad there, was that I thought as a scientist, the best way to have an impact was to look at things from a global perspective from on high, literally. That's what I thought good science was. And that's how I thought I'd have the biggest impact on society. And that's kind of a thing in science. The studies that often get noticed are the ones that look, that look at things from a big sweeping view, answering questions on a grand scale. Those are the studies that get published in high profile, coveted journals and get picked up by mainstream media. Those are the studies that help scientists get jobs and grants that fund their research. And while going for the big sweeping view at the top of the mountain might work to get noticed by other scientists, it doesn't work for the general public. That's something I realized when I started working as a science communicator, or someone who breaks down scientific and technical information so non-experts can understand. And now as a journalist who covers science topics. What I realized along my career, filled with switchbacks from science to science communication to journalism, is that going for the big, global, all-encompassing view isn't the best way to connect with the public. The best way to connect and rebuild public trust in science is to head back into the cloud forest and focus on something like the hot pink mushroom growing out of a log, the bird calls cutting through the wind, or the frogs jumping on and off the trail. Public trust in science has hit a low point. Less than a third of Americans say they have a great deal of trust in science, and that's down 10% from where it was a few months before the pandemic began. Science, a field that's all about evidence, that's checked over and over and over again, has gotten lumped in with the culture wars. In my decade of hiking through cloud forests, I could see the effects of climate change unfolding before my eyes. Birds weren't where they should be, and sometimes the forest floor was so dry that it was cracked. But people were never going to see what I saw. And that's okay. I just needed to find a way to meet people where they were at. I always used to say in my classes and pre presentations that everyone's an expert in something, whether it be their job, their hobbies, their life story in general. You just have to find a way to connect your expertise with theirs. And to rebuild public trust in science, universities, scientific institutions, and media outlets need to break down barriers, bust some misperceptions about each other, and find common ground. First, what it means to be successful in science has to change. And that has to start at the top, at the higher up levels of colleges, universities, and scientific institutions. Academic institutions need to rethink what the ultimate outcome of science should be. As it stands now, there's what's called a publish or perish culture. Basically, this means that getting a job or grant and being seen 
is largely dependent on how many papers that scientists publish. And don't get me long, wrong, there's lots of people out there doing great mentoring, outreach, teaching, and science communication. But these service activities don't count, at least not like they should, and not in a way that puts public trust at the forefront. One way to fix this is for academic institutions to hire science communicators to teach classes, workshops, and seminars to faculty, students, and even scientists outside of their organizations. As it stands now, academic institutions expect faculty who happen to be good at talking to the public to teach these classes and seminars. But they usually aren't trained in science communication and their abilities are largely centered around whatever their expertise is. And without that training, a researcher who's working in a lab studying fruit fly hearts is probably not gonna be super helpful to an astrophysicist studying black holes. Instead, academic institutions need to hire science communicators to take that first step to make sure that cool science gets out to the public. And a lot of scientists, especially young scientists who can be a big part of the solution, are craving this. And I bet a lot of scientists don't even realize that science communicators are out there. But they are. And scientists need to pressure their universities to invest in them. Another thing that needs to happen is that academic institutions need to create a space for scientists to localize their research and connect with local communities. One way to do this is to create opportunities for scientists and journalists to come together and learn from each other. This can be at public outreach events, panels, workshops, or seminars. I always like to say that scientists and journalists, they do exactly the same thing. They are looking for answers to questions that are important to society. They just do this at very different time scales. As someone who's a science communicator, who tries to be a go-between between, between scientists and journalists, I know firsthand the, that the relationship between the two is kind of complicated. One big problem is that scientists don't understand how science becomes news. And that's the fault of universities. Some scientists even scoff at the idea of talking to local outlets. It's the big name national outlets that they have their eye on because they think that local outlets either don't cover science or they won't do a good job at it. And journalists, by all means, they have a lot of room to grow too. Journalists are trying to report on so many different things with limited time and resources to do so. Journalists also need to realize that it's deeply ingrained within scientists, that they can't say anything unless they have a study that they can use to back themselves up. That's why you often hear scientists use words like maybe, could, possibly, or likely. And both scientists and journalists need to realize that a news story doesn't just have to happen once a study is, is published. There's no real endpoint to science. It's also full of switchbacks. Every time there's a result, there's always a follow-up question. Stories about the curiosity, the process, or the lengths that scientists go to do their research can go a long way in humanizing science. Like how I spent from sunrise to sunset hiking up and down the mountain with a backpack filled with nearly half my weight in soil. Or how I got swarmed by hundreds of killer bees at the top of that very mountain in Costa Rica and then built my entire PhD dissertation research project around that field site. Investing in science communication and training scientists to connect with the public will not only help get great science out there, but it will humanize scientists and break apart the mystery about what they do and why they do it. Something that the public can do, consume science media and other scientific information real science media, from veteran outlets with journalists, not the latest viral post on Facebook. And also realize that science is imperfect, but spotting that imperfection and correcting it is built in to the scientific process. 
And that sometimes comes off as scientists not being able to make up their minds. Take COVID masks, for example. But really, that's just checking, double-checking, and checking once again. And bridging these gaps between science and the public will mean going back into the cloud forest. It will mean focusing on the mushrooms, the birds, the trees, the soil. Or perhaps being open to noticing something new altogether, to build connection and meet people where they're at. Because if you're taking in the view all at once, you're likely missing a lot and leaving a lot of people behind.